Okay, <laughs> we'll go ahead and get started. Hello and welcome to NOAA's National Ocean Service Science Seminar Series. My name is Tracy Gill and I'm the coordinator for this series. We have partnered with the U.S. Global Change Research Program, or USGCRP, on this fourth National Climate Assessment Seminar Series. And my co-host is Katie Reeves, the Engagement and Communications Lead for the USGCRP National Coordination Office. I will provide a few seminar logistics and then Katie will introduce the speaker. First, if you are interested in getting a PDF copy or recording of today's presentation, Katie will list the relevant websites in our chat box. Or you can contact me, tracy.gill at noaa.gov or Katie Reeves, and her email is in the chat box too. If you are not on NOAA's weekly science seminar list but you'd like to be, go ahead and call me or email me at tracy.gill at noaa.gov and I'll add you to that list. Folks in the room, please sign in and silence your phones. And now Katie will introduce the seminar and our speakers. Katie? Great. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Um, thank you, Tracy. And thanks, Noah, for hosting what is now the eighth of 11, 11 installments of our webinar series focused on the findings of the fourth National Climate Assessment. As Tracy said, I'm Katie Reeves, the Engagement and Communications Lead for the U.S. Global Change Research Program, or USGCRP. The Global Change Research Act of 1990 mandates that USGCRP assist the nation and the world to understand, assess, predict, and respond to human-induced and natural processes of global change. And one way that we do that is through the development of a quadrennial national climate assessment. The fourth assessment was released in two volumes. The first volume, the Climate Science Special Report, was released in November of 2017, and it was covered in an earlier webinar series, which can be found on our website. That's www.globalchange.gov slash engage slash webinars. I will share that in the chat box in a moment, so don't worry about writing that down. And the second volume, Impacts, Risks, and Adaptation in the United States, that's the focus of this series. As the title indicates, NCA 4 Volume 2 assesses the observed and projected impacts of climate change across the United States, covering 17 national level topics and 10 regions. The assessment was released in November of 2018, and you can read and download it at nca2018.globalchange.gov. I've already dropped that link in the chat box. Today, I'm really excited to introduce Rachel Novak as she presents on climate change in tribes and indigenous peoples, findings from the fourth national climate assessment. Rachel is coordinator of the Bureau of Indian Affairs Tribal Resilience Program and also serves as the Tribal Resilience Science Coordinator. She leads efforts to support tribal resilience, including the annual competitive funding opportunity for tribal adaptation planning. She also led the development of the Tribes and Indigenous Peoples chapter of the Fourth National Climate Assessment as federal coordinating lead author, and that's why we're so lucky to have her here today. From 2008 through 2015, she worked on the development of water quality standards through the Clean Water Act at the US EPA's Office of Water in Washington, DC. Rachel has a master's degree in geosciences from the University of Arizona and a bachelor's in environmental science, international studies and environmental science from Oregon State University. Thank you so much for joining us for today's NOAA Science Seminar, everyone, and I will turn it over to you, Rachel. All right, thanks very much, Katie, um, and thanks, Tracy. I appreciate you for having me here today. Um, everyone. Uh, good morning. My name is Rachel Novak, as Katie mentioned. Um, and I am uh, currently in Albuquerque, New Mexico, closer to uh, our original homelands. Um, I'm from the Navajo Nation, um, and I'm glad to be here with you today. Um, as uh, Katie mentioned, I was the federal coordinating lead author for Chapter 15 of the National Climate, the Fourth National Climate Assessment, um, for the Tribes and Indigenous Peoples Chapter. Um, and I worked with a really great author team uh, for I think a little more than the last three, over the last three years to develop this chapter. Um, and I'll say that the National Climate Assessment is really progressing um, in terms of addressing impacts and actions of indigenous peoples, um, not only in this chapter, um, but also in um, the other chapters, especially in the regional chapters. Um, we did coordinate across some of the author teams from those regional chapters, especially as well as some of the sectoral ones. Um, and we tried to ensure that there was integration and representation of indigenous peoples' issues. Um, and actions um, on all those other chapters. And um, I was uh, really excited when um, all of us, um, well, we all had uh, representation at um, AGU, the American Geophysical Union, in December, um, just last December 2018. And because we saw, as I was going through looking at all of those, I saw, um, I saw indigenous peoples uh, represented, um, represented in so many key message 
key messages um, across each of the regional chapters. And so um, I do invite you to take a look, um, not just at this chapter, um, chapter 15 that is, uh, but the other regional chapters as well, because um, you'll see content in there um, focused on indigenous people. So I just wanted to mention that um, so no one gets the misconception that this is the only place that uh, tribes and indigenous peoples um, are represented in the National Climate Assessment. OK, uh, next slide, please. All right, um, and I'll go through this pretty quickly because it sounded like um, Tracy and Katie already went through um, kind of the, the big picture. Um, but yeah, for those who aren't as familiar, um, the, the USGCRP started in 1989 as a presidential initiative and was mandated by Congress, um, the Global Change Research Act of 1990. Um, so there have been three national um, assessments before this assessment. Um, the forest, and you can see um, logos from many of, well, all, I think all of the um, federal agencies that are involved in its development. All right, next slide. All right, um, and I also wanted to mention that there were various national climate assessment products uh, prior to um, prior to this this forest assessment, and our our chapter um, focused on um, climate impacts and actions of indigenous peoples. Um, and uh, it preceded our work, um, and I want to make sure that we do uh, pay respect to these um, assessments. Uh, in uh, 1998 and 2009, there were two, uh, there were both uh, workshops in those years um, called Native Peoples, Native Homelands. Um, and then, um, of course, as many of you probably know, um, Chapter 12 of the third NCA um, had, was the first time that there was a full, uh, full blown chapter um, devoted to impacts uh, um, of climate change on indigenous peoples. And then uh, the climate health assessment followed shortly thereafter, um, and it has a strong component also that's focused on climate health impacts on indigenous peoples. Um, so I just wanted to recognize that previous work. Um, and uh, you know, our task as an author team was to, to build on and not replicate what um, was previously done uh, with our colleagues that worked so hard on these previous um, assessments. All right, slide four, please. All right, and I wanted to mention uh, a bit before I get into our okay. um, our uh, chapter. Um, one more thing. Oh, Katie, did some. I'm sorry, Are Rachel. Are you on Hi, there... on the process slide? Yes. Yep. We can see everything. Yes. On the process slide. Okay. All right. I'll sorry, continue. Rachel. Um. Yes. The development okay. process slide. No worries. Thanks. <laughs> um. So uh, the development process um, was really, uh, there was a strong focus on engaging partners, um, our tribal um, uh, uh, colleges and universities. We worked with um, them to help develop an outreach process that supported community meetings, um, tribal travel to attend regional engagement workshops, um, and um, so several uh, meetings where we had um, colleagues from those TCUs go out to try to get the word out about different opportunities um, to provide um, comments um, during public comment um, periods um, and in early stages of our writing. Um, so uh, we had several um, engagement opportunities to really try to get um, the word out about um, the assessment and kind of solicit some input on that. Um, so thanks. All right, next slide. Okay. Um, so um, on, in, our, in our process, kind of continuing on that vein, um, we focused on recent literature um, that had come out since the NCA3 um, um, in 2014. And, um, and we also developed a database of tribal adaptation actions. Um, and these really helped contribute um, to our key messages, both of these. Um, and just uh, uh, emphasis again, um, the NCA4 really took a risk-based approach, uh, focusing on what's important um, and what is at risk as a starting point, um, rather than you know how specific climate parameters um, will change. Um, and uh, so the key messages really reflect that approach, um, and they're comprised of broad integrated areas that are often at the heart of what indig indigenous communities care about, livelihoods and economies, society and health, um, indigenous um, adaptation. Um, so again, we tried to build on and update rather than rec replicate what was in um, the Third National um, Climate Assessment, Indigenous Peoples of Chapters, and in previous work. All right, so next slide. Thank you. So, um, so the chapter um, opens up with um, state of the sector, um, and we set the stage that way, um, trying to recognize several key points uh, prior to getting into the key messages. 
Um, and those are the indigenous peoples in the United States are diverse and distinct political and cultural groups and populations. And though many indigenous peoples may be affected by climate change in ways that are similar to others in the United States, um, indigenous peoples can also be affected uniquely and disproportionately. And many indigenous peoples have lived in particular areas for hundreds if not thousands of years, or, or time immemorial as we often say. Um, and indigenous peoples' histories and shared experiences engender distinct knowledge about climate change impacts and strategies for adaptation. Um, and then um, lastly, um, the uh, indigenous peoples' traditional knowledge systems can play a role in advancing and understanding um, climate change um, impacts and developing more comprehensive um, adaptation strategies. Um, and I do want to mention, too, something that we really try to emphasize in this chapter is that it's not just all about impacts and vulnerabilities facing indigenous peoples. Um, it's about adaptation strategies and actions um, that so many um, indigenous communities are taking across the, the U.S. All right, next slide. All right, so we're getting into our key messages here. Um, so our first one is really focused on indigenous livelihoods and economies at risk. Um, so NCA3, um, prior to our work, really set a strong baseline for so many of the impacts um, on traditional livelihoods and economies. And we wanted to build on that and also address some of the impacts on commercial tribal economies as well, things like energy, recreation, and tourism. These economies are affected by climate change, uh, but compounding and complicating this is often the institutional barriers to self-determined management of water, land, and other natural resources and infrastructure. All right, next slide. Thanks. So key message, key message two um, was really more focused on the risks to physical, mental, and indigenous values-based health. Um, and indigenous values-based health is focused on interconnectedness of social and ecological systems. So as climate, climate change disrupts the system, individual and community health um, can be uniquely challenged through impacts to land and water, food, and plants and animals. And these impacts can threaten sites and practices, traditional practices, and relationships with cultural, spiritual, or ceremonial importance um, that are central to indigenous people's heritage, heritages, um, identity, and physical and mental health. And that uh, figure that we have down there um, on the right um, in the chapter, it's figure 15.2. Um, and it really is kind of focused on some of the interconnected issues here. Um, so this especially here shows how infrastructure and essential services it develops, de uh, delivers um, to uh, are key to a community's livelihoods and economic potential. And many indigenous um, peoples already face acute infrastructure challenges that can really compound climate change impacts. Um, so the text in that uh, figure um, really describe um, more how there's existing challenges um, in these communities and uh, that can be compounded. So. All right, um, next slide on key message three. Okay, so our third key message is focused on adaptation, disaster management, displacement, and community-led relocation. Um, so this is a really a very meaty um, key message, um, combining uh, quite a few things that are very interconnected. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, there's, there's a lot of discussion and acknowledgement of the risks, um, but we don't want to stop there because um, there's so much going on um, in indigenous people's um, communities um, across the nation. Um, many indigenous people, peoples have been really proactive in identifying and addressing impacts and developing plans, um, and that's an important aspect across uh, the assessment um, in our chapter in particular. Um, but again, there are these institutional barriers that can severely limit adaptive capacity, including things like limited access to traditional territory and resources, um, limitation um, of existing policies, programs, and funding mechanisms. And the key message also discusses, importantly, how successful adaptation in indigenous contexts relies on the use of indigenous knowledges, uh, resilient and robust social systems and protocols, and a commitment to principles of self-determination and proactive efforts of, of governments at all levels to alleviate these institutional barriers. Okay, all right, and slide seven. So I'm getting into some of the figures um, that we have in our chapter now. Um, so this is a chapter, or this is a, these are figures um, of some of the communities that are facing um, displacement and, um, you know, expansion or relocation. Um, that was really um, a highlight of our, our third key message. Um, so the figure illustrates some of the common issues that are that are um, 
faced by coastal areas, especially in the southeast um, and the, on the left side there. Um, that is the Ile de Jean Charles, um, the indigenous community there that are facing the, those issues um, uh, from uh, encroaching seawater, um, from sea level rise, and, um, and other issues that are uh, endangering their homelands. Um, and then on the right there, um, similarly, but in a very different location, is the island of Kivalina, Alaska. Um, that again is also facing many of those issues that, that other coastal communities in Alaska are facing um, due to storm surges and uh, reduction in sea ice that used to protect their, um, their coastal areas um, from that kind of erosion. So um, these were two of the aerial views of those communities. Um, and uh, the, the risks that they're facing. Um, and let's go to the next uh, slide, please. And this is figure 14 um, of our chapter. Um, and uh, I'm drawing again from the, the, uh, the issues that are facing uh, community members of Ile de Jean Charles. Uh, this is um, a photo of some of the active planning that's been going on in, uh, in their community um, as they um, are facing um, uh, relocation, or as many are terming it now, um, expansion into other areas that are safer. Um, and uh, and this is kind of currently ongoing. Um, and we wanted to put this in here as a representation of, of the many um, uh, community-led relocation efforts that are ongoing um, in many of our coastal communities. So next slide, please. All right, and here we also have um, Something else that came out of um, the Chapter 15, um, Tribes and Indigenous People chapter. Um, and this is um, a glossary that came out of that. Um, and this arose especially out of um, a lot of the discussions across chapters focused on tribal communities. Um, and we wanted to, we decided that it would be important to try to maintain consistency across um, the entire assessment and try to explain the usage of some terms that maybe not everyone was familiar with or, or they might have had um, a couple different, a couple different meanings. Um, and so, um, so we developed this um, and they're, they're pretty concise definitions. If you'd like to see them, um, you can find them on, on NAU's ITEP website. It, the link is right there. Um, ITEP is an Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals. Um, and so they are, they're home right there. Um, and we, we do want to mention that this isn't a definitive or exhaustive definition of them. We try to keep them um, concise here. Um, but this, um, this is to try to help maintain consistency and meaning across um, these terms when they're used um, in, in most, many of the chapters across the uh, fourth assessment. Okay, next slide, please. All right. Um, so um, right here, this is an example of what we have in Figure 15.1. Um, it was slightly looks a little different in the actual report, but we ended up turning that into um, that um, that figure of, of mapping actions of Indigenous peoples into um, an online uh, mapping application uh, that is interactive. Um, so again, we wanted to really um, build on the previous assessments and works that had been done uh, by by continue to em emphasize the impact, ongoing impact, um, and the barriers that are facing indigenous communities, um, indigenous nations. But we also wanted to um, move from there and talk about the adaptation actions and the many, many activities that tribes have been undertaking in the last decade to address climate change through things like planning, vulnerability assessments, monitoring, capacity building, um, and, and many more. So in 2016, we started to develop a database of these actions. Um, we inquired from our partners um, across federal agencies um, that have funded uh, tribal climate change adaptation actions, activities, um, and um, vulnerability especially. So we identified um, over 800 and we developed this living interactive web map um, online um, and the website is right up there. You can find it at biamaps.gui.gov backslash nca. Um, and it's linked to in our report as well um, in the chapter. So um, we, we do want this to be like a living um, interactive map. So if you see, if you know of an action or an activity um, that isn't on here, um, please do um, email us. Um, and my email is at the end. Um, and uh, we'll make sure to add it. So, um, so yeah, so this map um, is something that we really hope can be used um, 
down the road um, uh, for NCA5 um, to see some of the progress that's been ongoing and also to really um, help tribes that, that are thinking of their next steps, um, uh, the actions that they, that they um, can take and so that they'll be able to see examples um, here and um, identify, you know, what would be appropriate for them um, wherever they are. So, so um, that's, those are a couple of the uses utilities that we really hope um, this interactive mapping application has. So um, I'll, I'll do a quick drive with you through it in the next few slides. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Right, next slide. Thanks. Um, so just a little bit about the functionality. So you can um, um, search um, up in the upper left there. Just um, type in a, a tribe or a group name. Um, you can also just um, um, zoom in and zoom out also and click on any of these um, icons in here. Um, and the icons represent different action types. Um, so we tried to, to um, kind of label um, action types um, in the description of the actual database. So, and um, that might be the hardest for you guys to see, um, but there's um, the yellow um, circles represent planning and assessment type activities. And the red triangle represents adaptation and implementation type activities. Um, the green cross represents monitoring and research activities. The purple um, square represents um, governance capacity building. And the kind of turquoise star represents youth and cultural continuity um, activities, and including um, traditional uh, knowledge. Um, so you can search by a tribe or group name or just click on any of the action symbols in the map. Um, and that the action symbols are different, and that's um, those are how we um, how we uh, tried to kind of bend them. So uh, next slide. All right. So if you click on any of those um, action icons, um, a uh, window will pop up. Um, and so here's an example. This one's from the Jamestown Squalum Tribe. Um, and it'll if the tribe has more than one actions, it'll um, up in the top uh, left of the little um, window, it'll say one of three or whatnot. This one says one of 61. Um, and that's just because we um, aren't zoomed in enough. Um, so uh, it's, it's uh, representing like multiple um, tribes right in there. And the Northwest has been really, um, really active for, for quite a while. So, um, so there's, there's many activities up there. So as you zoom in more and you click on individual um, action icons, then you'll get um, you'll see if there's uh, multiple ones you can scroll across for each tribe. Um, so you can um, click on that, that little arrow there that I have um, circled on the right of that window. And OK, next slide. All right, and the other thing you can do, aside from um, going through the multiple actions and you know seeing the activity and the, the sector that we um, bend it under and the, and the link to the more information, um, is you can click on the little ellipse there um, on the bottom right. Uh, next slide. Um, and the attribute table option will pop up. So you can click on that. Next slide. Um, and that attribute table um, basically kind of links to that, um, the whole database. Um, so you can get more information there um, on the tribe group name, the action title, um, the URL address, the type, the activity, um, and the sector. Um, and some of them that, that are um, multi-sectoral, we have their labeled that way. Um, so um, yeah, and you can click on the different tabs. Um, if there's multiple ones for that tribe, um, uh, they'll be listed there. Um, you can get information more on the, the federally recognized tribal lands and the NCA4 regions as well. Uh, next slide, please. All right. Um, so that was the interactive action map. Um, as I kind of wind down here, I wanted to remind you of the key messages um, that we went over um, from our chapter. Um, and so the first one is really focused on um, impacts on indigenous livelihoods and economies um, and how those are at risk. The second one is focused on uh, risk to culture, mental, cultural, mental, and physical health. Um, and the third one is focused on adaptation, disaster uh, management, displacement, community library locations, slash um, expansion. Um, so um, next slide. So 
So um, I would be remiss if I didn't um, thank my chapter author team here. We had a really great chapter um, team, and uh, yeah, we, we couldn't have done this without any of them. Um, so I wanted to thank them and acknowledge them. Uh, next slide. And I also wanted to acknowledge um, our coordinators on the UC, um, UCG, UC, US UCRP um, side, uh, Susan and Eliza. Um, next slide. All right, so Ayosha, uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, there were so many people involved um, across all the chapters, and these, this is a snapshot of some of them. Um, so next slide. Um, and this is um, kind of where you can find more information or citations for the chapter or where to find the full chapter. And then one more slide. Yeah, once you open the door, then All right, here, um, if you have, yeah, I'm happy to take questions now. Um, and then this is just a, a link to some of the um, some of the products that I mentioned, uh, the, tra the chapter itself, um, the terminology, um, the glossary that I mentioned, um, my uh, program's website, um, the actions map, and then my, um, my contact information. Um, so thanks, Tracy and Katie, for setting this up. Um, I appreciate it, and I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank you so much, Rachel, and I'm sorry about all the technical and sound problems we had today. Katie had to drop off because their internet dropped completely off. So folks online, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them. Oh, Katie's back. <laughs> so if you have any questions, go ahead and type them into the chat. So Meg, I did notice, put up the link to the, um, or Genevieve put the link to the uh, GIS uh, piece that you showed us with all the tribes, and somebody was telling me that the number of tribes are up to 574 now. 573. Yeah, there. Um, yeah, several. Seven, yeah, 573. I believe there were six um, tribes that um, gained their federal uh, recognition in um, in Virginia um, early last year. Um, and that's just federally recognized tribes. There are um, state recognized um, indigenous communities. Um, tribes and, um, and uh, those that aren't necessarily recognized statewide or federally um, but are, you know, still indigenous communities. Um, and we also, there, it's, it's pretty diverse, so there's also, um, you know, our, our brothers and sisters in, um, in the Caribbean and in, um, in the Pacific as well that um, uh, don't have, that aren't uh, federally recognized tribes in terms of that, um, that definition. Uh, but but you know our indigenous communities as well. So um, so with this chapter, we didn't focus just on federally recognized tribes. Um, we we took a, a much broader perspective of um, indigenous peoples um, across the the nation and as nations within nations. Okay, uh, we have a question from Britta who says, "I'm zooming into the Quinault Indian Nation Quinault. area, Quinault Indian Nation area on the map." And it looks like there are about six icons stacked on top of each other, regardless of how far I zoom in. Is there a way to toggle between them? Um, yeah. So if you click on um, if you click on them, um, since there are six actions for that tribe, there should be um, you should be able to scroll over and see six uh, uh, six actions if you click on it. Um, if not, I need to talk to my <laughs> my geospatial expert um, in our program and, and see if we can fix that. But um, yeah, that was some that was something we kind of struggled with geospatially to to try to um, make sure that um, we had icons that weren't just by color so that they were accessible to everyone. Um, so they're by shape and um, and yeah. And if you click on any of them, um, if it's for that tribe, then there should be um, six actions op that, that open up that you can scroll across. And I will double check if there's any issues there um, so that we can fix those. Okay, and now Monica follows up and says if you click on it, at the top of the box there is an arrow that helps you scroll. And we have a question here. Okay, thanks. Yeah, Rachel, did um, in the uh, map there with the various activities, did that include um, uh, other Federally funded activities like, say, FEMA mitigation uh, projects that were funded uh, that um, had some climate-related uh, mitigation actions. 
Yeah, yeah, good question. Yeah, we reached across to um, as many um, federal partners as we could think of that had funded federal activities. So we reached across to um, our other um, sister bureaus uh, within Department of Interior, um, as well as um, EPA, FEMA, NOAA, um, and several others. Um, but I don't, I hope this is, isn't, I hope I didn't um, describe it as something that's comprehensive. We did as much as we were able to, um, but I'm sure there's some things that we missed. So this isn't uh, meant to be seen as exhaustive, and, and we're happy to update it as um, uh, yeah, if we've missed things or if there's more that come online, um, we can add them there. So um, if there's something you see that's not there, um, uh, please do um, send us a, a note and information on it and, and kind of a link to where more information is, and, and we'll, uh, we'll put that in there. But yeah, the, the FEMA one should be in there, at least um, up until um, early last year. We do need to update it. Um, with my program um, alone, we have 100, more than 100 awards from last year that we still need to update. And then we have um, uh, this year's um, funding awards as well that uh, will can be added to that um, when we get those out um, before the end of the fiscal year. Okay, thanks. And I have a question for you, Rachel, mm -hmm. on tribal resilience actions. Like, for example, say a tribe is trying to do a new action. Can they le learn more about each action that's done in other areas to see if it fits what they need? Is there like descriptions or a guide to resilience mm -hmm. actions? Um, well, in terms of the map, yeah, when you click on um, any of those actions, we do have a link with more information. Um, some of them might, might be in progress if it's something we funded last year and the tribe might, might not be completely finished with. Um, it will take you to um, a summary that we have on our website online, and it's just usually a few sentences long. Um, but it does kind of open the door if they want to contact that tribe to get more information. Um, the the full-blown uh, kind of final um, product might not be something that's online yet. Um, or that the tribe might not necessarily want to be put online yet. So um, it does kind of open the door to, for them to contact them um, with, uh, um, you know, to, for, for further information. But, but a lot of them right now, the, the, when you click on that link, it will go to a summary that will have, you know, a few sentences of what they, um, what the, that tribe is doing. That's um, great because, you know, lessons learned. And some of them will link to the full report too. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you're asking if there's kind of a lessons learned yeah. document? Um, let's see. I think, like, comprehensively across all of them, we don't have, like, a, a full lessons learned. There's so much diversity with what, um, what um, tribes are undertaking uh, that we don't have, um, like, a, a document that, that goes through everything with kind of a comprehensive lessons learned. You, and are you talking in terms of... Um, um, to help try other tribes get started with uh, developing vulnerability assessments or adaptation plans, like how they can start? Yeah, I don't mean more for, uh, just to like say somebody has a similar kind of issue and a sim like perhaps on a river or something, they can look at other tribes that are on rivers for those solutions. You know? Yeah, yeah, and that's why we, we tried to um, kind of tag every all of the actions with um, like a sector um, so that tribes could search um, that way or by, by region. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's that's the hope is that um, we can um, help facilitate some of that learning. Um, so tribes that are further along with developing assessments and plans um, can help some tribes that, that are trying to figure out like where, where they should start. Um, so that was that was the intent. Um, and I think as we go along and we kind of can refine it, um, hopefully it will it will um, yeah do do serve that purpose better better and better. Great, thank you. And Sarah Frederick has a question. Are you coordinating with HUD on the actions? Um, yeah, so actually one of our authors was from HUD, um, Chris Narducci. Um, he helped with that large block grant that um, went to the state of Louisiana to help the Elder John Charles um, Band of, uh, let's see, Chittimac Jabaloxi Indians. I hope I got the name full name right, but but uh, I think more commonly known as Elder John Charles. Um, yeah, we um, we also um, coordinated. Um, yeah, I think we coordinated with HUD as well. So he was there and, and helped us incorporate some of them. But like I said, if there's something that we missed, we, um, we're happy to, to add that. So if you see something that isn't in there, um, please do let us know, and we'll try to, to add that. 
Okay. And Katie had texted me she has gotten kicked out twice. So she notes, before I get kicked out again, you can download the chapter, the executive summaries, and even chapter-specific PowerPoint files here. And she gives a link. Are there any other questions in the room? Online, any other questions? Well, Rachel, thanks so much for a terrific presentation. And once again, sorry for the technical difficulties. And uh, next Tuesday, I want to remind people at the same time, 12 to 1, we'll be having, I think, the ninth talk. And it'll be on tourism and recreation in a changing climate. And uh, we hope you can join us. So, and David Remailer notes, Meg, the other thing you can do is click the three dots in the bottom right of the pop-up window. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, thanks. Okay, well, thanks, everybody, for joining us. And, uh, Rachel, once again, thanks very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much for setting this all up. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Okay, oh, we got a few more. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.